And for our very first talk, uh, we are going to have um, Avil uh, Genin Karlut. Uh, he's affiliated research uh, at uh, Kairos Research in the Active Inference Lab and uh, will be presenting to us today Intelligence Without Creativity Can Active Inference Ground Our Understanding of Life, Cognition and Society? Um, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, so the main criticism that is addressed uh, toward the FEP and Active Inference is that it explains grounds intelligence without creativity, which is it explains a uh, kind of epistemic inference, a uh, kind of information integration from the external world to the agent, but it does not allow any kind of historical or creative dynamics within the agent, which are characteristic of uh, living and cognitive systems. Uh, this criticism uh, comes mainly from an activist, and uh, it has drawn people to accept that active inference uh, is not a real thing, uh, is only an instrumental principle that can help us understand the world, but has no truth or per se explanatory value. Uh, what I'm going to define here is first that it's this kind of um, status is in fact pretty good. It's pretty useful to have uh, inspiratory principles that help uh, some things without being true. But uh, the FEP actually grounds uh, the evolution of cognitive systems and synchronization. And uh, however, it can only do so if we revise basically our interpretation of it and build math that withstand the shock of uh, creative evolution. So, uh, what is active inference? Active inference derives from a well, result known as the Fungi Principle, which states, it has been stated a lot of time in the conference, uh, that demical systems that, that, that have sufficiently regular boundaries will self cognize so as to minimize uh, informational uh, value that's called uh, VFE, version of energy. And that entails either both that, uh, that they maximize evidence for the model, uh, the world model they embody, uh, or uh, that they constrain the expected volatility of what they do and perceive. Uh, it is expressed in the following math. Uh, what is important to see here is that uh, two values that are actually perceptible by the agent, which is the complexity of their uh, world model and the uh, density of mistakes basically they make. Uh, they provide a natural uh, bound, an upper bound on uh, log evidence, which means that it physically constrains the amount of surprise uh, they will get. And if they are surprised by bad events, they will persist into existence in virtue of minimizing it. So uh, active inference is basically the idea that actual cognitive systems do that, they minimize VFE. Uh, what it means to minimize VFE is that across uh, Markov blockets, which is basically a screen uh, mediating, mediating states uh, through which I understand my world, uh, there is a synchronization, there is uh, the self-organization of a manifold of a structure uh, in which I self-organize. And what active inference says basically is that this is equivalent to saying that uh, there is some kind of cognitive agent which make implicit inference over uh, their instrumental flow. So that's what we're talking about. So uh, the presentation will go in three parts. First, uh, present the integrative instrumental view. Second, present the grounding how actually view. And third, uh, present and address the problem of self-creation in living systems. So you have basically three kinds of scientific explanation. You have explaining with laws, explaining with mechanisms, and explaining with functions, which answer basically to what a phenomenon is, how does it work, why is it this way. So the nomological is kind of uh, a side in the sense that there is universal laws that must not ever be falsified, while mechanical and functional uh, explanation are basically two interpretation, two properties of a uh, context-specific mechanical model. So uh, what you will do with mechanical and functional explanation is basically check whether they are consistent with the system structure and history, and uh, for mechanical explanation, uh, see if they predict what the system does, and for functional explanation, try to deduce constraints on mechanism. While nomological uh, allows explanation, they are basically validated by inductions, 
and uh, they are relevant if you can deduce uh, from them some uh, phenomenologically important part of the system. Uh, basically, you do a collectivation by setting the system behave as if some law uh, was respected, was causally efficient. You manage the explanation by saying how actually a system is structured and works. Functional explanation uh, by saying why it must be this way. The friendship principle does all of these things. It's mainly invoked as a naive explanation for influence-like behavior. Uh, it also provides a functional imperative on how cognitive system must or must have worked, and it is even related to the hierarchical predictive processing, which is specific mechanical theory of cognition. So, what is it? Um, what is important to understand is that the FEP, unlike uh, what is proposed by some, is not a universal explanation. Uh, what is accepted today, the integrative view? is that, uh, don't for, uh, so far, Andrews, it is to elicit question that might go and ask for a first time. Uh, it is uh, to provide a guideline uh, to discover and uh, motivate actual mechanical explanations. Sorry, I have to cut something. So, uh, what it means is that uh, the action framework reduced to an ontology, which, which means a uh, formal language and a set of concepts, of generative concepts, models, sorry, uh, that allow us to study self possession over scales. So what it does is that it provides us with a kind of unified uh, theoretical approach uh, of nature uh, that allows to integrate different fields uh, at the conceptual level, but it does not prevent the development of domain-specific mechanical explanation. It does not prevent integration. So it's a pretty ideal tool for uh, what is historically understood as the naturalistic approach to science. Let us see how this works. I can look at a wood lice. I can look at a city which uh, Blue presented in uh, yesterday. And, and can look at them as cognitive agents that enact models of a niche. I can look at how uh, they minimize free energy at various scales. This of uh, behavior, this of development, this of uh, phylogeny, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can basically use this set of language to integrate mechanism processes ID across scales in a single integrated setting of the organism, which is pretty nice. <laughs> What I say is that uh, active inference, in addition to this, also allows us to ground uh, the study of intelligence, which is uh, provide a basic physical explanation for how we get intelligence in the first uh, place. So first, let us see what is a complete failure at grounding the study of intelligent systems, which is uh, self organized criticality. Uh, there is a widespread agreement in neuroscientists and systems biologists, uh, including activists, that intelligent systems uh, must be near a critical phase transition um, to process information. So what a critical phase transition is, is a transition between an ordered and disordered phase uh, where uh, you have not order, not disorder, uh, multiscale uh, behavior. So in the brain, you do have multiscale behavior. So that's a win for the critical uh, theorist, I guess. Well, no. Because what they do is basically to uh, provide the law that says um, cognitive systems must be scale invariant. It is a nomological explanation of uh, pretty uh, shallow uh, phenomenological aspects of intelligence. It does not say in virtue of what uh, this structure is connected. It does not say how we get intelligence. It does not say uh, why this specific organization matches this specific niche or provide this specific phenomenology. It says nothing of this. Active inference uh, precisely address that. Uh, the active inference framework proposes a basic synchronization across Markov blockets uh, as a process that grounds the emergence of semantic or cognitive properties, the emergence of basically matches between uh, the world, uh, an agent perceive, and uh, what it does in this world. Uh, let us zoom back to see how it meshes with physics. Uh, when you have a system that is at equilibrium, which is that does not exchange information, matter, or energy, it uh, minimizes uh, something, a, a value that is called free energy, that integrates basically the amount of energy that is in the system and the amount of information it takes to define it. 
One, uh, you expose a uh, system to a dissipative flow, for example, uh, energy flow that is entailed by hitting uh, the bottom of a pot, of a water pot. Then uh, you get exchange of energy and information at uh, the, um, the periphery of a system. And then uh, the landscape of uh, the minimized functional changes and the system integrates in addition to an intrinsic information geometry that reduces its basic equilibrium state. It integrates an intrinsic information geometry that uh, translates how the extrinsic flow that is imposed upon it um, takes shape physically in its uh, structure. And this extrinsic information geometry drives meaningful deviation from equilibrium. It drives a change into the actual physical structure of the system. And the inference framework says basically this. So uh, what is the relation of that to uh, intelligent uh, operating systems that are much more complicated than but uh, on a fire? Uh, basically, it says that this uh, synchronization driven uh, Functional integration happens at all scale at all moment. At any scale, you can look and describe a system. Uh, if you describe it as a set of dynamical equations, there is a process of self organization that entails the reduction of its dimensionality, that entails symmetry breaking and the emergence of structural constraints that will work outside uh, the scope at which the system is defined, that will work, for example, uh, a structural constraint in a de-zoomed in a scalar view of the system. So this in and of itself does not comes pretty far from solving the problem of uh, cognitive organization uh, because there is in fact a pretty strong disagreement about the hierarchy, the architecture of living and cognition and cognitive systems between um, FEP theorists and systems biologists. FEP theorists are interested with control are interested with statistical inference. So they talk of uh, hierarchical modularity, fractal hierarchy, of blankets within blankets within blankets within blankets. While system biologists are interested in how systems self-produce. So they're interested in how a set of constraints that is embodied within a physical system uh, manages to produce and create itself. So the topology is just not the same. It's fractal versus meshes, but it's not a uh, property of the basic uh, Markov blanket formalism. So it's nothing critical. It's something that can be fixed within the formalism. Something that is not, however, is the way uh, cognitive systems, uh, living systems, as an activist emphasize a lot, self-create. Uh, so let us demystify uh, this and explain what it means to self-create. In physics, we have a basic epistemological construct that is a state space, that is a mathematical space that we declare has all of the relevant information to explain the behavior of a system. Often, uh, it will be macroscopic thermodynamic variables that are the only one that matter in virtue of uh, the very strong symmetry of classical physical system and the basically averaging out of all micro fluctuations. Um, in biological system, however, you have much more complicated kind of symmetry breakings. You have multi-scale kind of symmetry breakings that are organized in a very specific way without which uh, the system does not keep working, it dies. And most importantly, these symmetries are built throughout the system history at both uh, developmental and evolutionary scales. And it is built by multi-scale fluctuations that work basically from quantum and thermal noise, so they are not predictable. There is no way to predict them. And uh, so you have a pretty strong sense of historicity. You have specific events that make the system break out of a deterministic landscape and do new things, basically be creative. This is what a creative evolution is. And uh, the FEP framework just does not address it because uh, the way it demonstrates the FEP is to define a specific unique landscape, a specific a structural architecture, and then to look at what is the attracting distribution within this uh, space. So the construct, the object that does the explanation and uh, the object from which the explanation derives are both historyless. They're entailed by how you put the problem. And historyless systems, uh, which is formally mixing systems, which is stronger than ergodicity, by the way, there are systems that basically um, 
basically they dissolve. They uh, get into a specific shape and they stop moving. So you can have a kind of hysteresis or cyclical interesting behavior, but that's what you cannot have is a change in the structural condition of the system itself. Uh, what you cannot have is death, what you cannot have is creation, what you cannot have is life. So the FUP is, as is formulated, incompatible with uh, the representation of living systems. So it cannot explain them. Uh, what I say is that uh, there is a pretty basic shift, now we all understand it, that could address this problem and make the FUP um, principle uh, grounding the physics of biological creation. Uh, this derives from the functional interpretation of the FUP. Basically, the FUP, the actant, the space, is really considered to represent uh, the cognitive landscape that is uh, subjectively enacted by the cognitive agent. So, Cognitive agents, uh, they have a straighted view. Uh, they can uh, change how they relate to bikes. Uh, most importantly, they cannot know possibly everything that's out here. So uh, their intrinsic space that is, that is described uh, within the actant framework, it cannot be because they closed. It cannot be a sufficient presentation. It cannot be in set space. And uh, it can actually routinely exchange information with its uh, intrinsic, extrinsic, sorry, I cannot say it, dynamics. Uh, you can have ways that the intrinsic dynamics uh, feed back into the extrinsic uh, world. Uh, niche construction, when an agent basically um, builds its need into a world, like when a beaver makes a dam, or by sending cognition, by using books to change the way I think. Uh, or you can have uh, elements of the world outside my cognitive landscape that work back into my intrinsic landscape, uh, which is learning, for example, uh, learning how to um, bike, which changes basically how I see a bike, or taking psychedelics that will change my neurodynamics to a very base level, or aging, or death, or being hurt. Uh, so. We can say that uh, synchronization across Markov blankets does not speak to self organization within a specific uh, set space, but it speaks to how uh, set space are created by the activity of proto minds, basically, uh, basic constructs that enact uh, properties that we associate generally to cognitive systems. And uh, how these proto minds, in virtue of their uh, functional organization uh, and the symmetry breaking that is entailed by it, uh, build state spaces, unfold uh, measurable, uh, measurable symmetries and asymmetries in a specific systems, and create, strictly speaking, uh, biological state spaces. So, a uh, question that is that needs to be asked is uh, if set spaces are basic to physics and FEP explains how we get set spaces, is FEP basic to physics? My answer is that uh, it affords this. I don't know if it's true, but it's a possibility that acting in France basically gives us a very basic uh, construct that is at the grounding of all of physics. Um, the FEP can be understood as grounding the view that uh, the view that uh, first and called Markovian monism, that that called informational monism, um, and that is uh, the idea that what there is in the world, what uh, is the antique basis of physical existence, is basically information fields that do active inference. And uh, if those information fields are uh, prior uh, ontologically than what we observe as individual agents. Um, our life, uh, the existence of specific trajectories that are observable, will be entailed by synchronization across the micro blanket, basically synchronization. This pretty much directly speaks to quantum phenomenology, because the way the coherence, which is basically when uh, quantum objects lose their uh, quantum uh, properties, it works back in time, which means that if I observe no uh, particle that has been uh, um, individuated uh, as something in the past, my observation, uh, my observation now is becomes entangled with uh, the way uh, events folded out back then, back when the particle collapsed. Uh, so what this means 
is not that you have backward causation. This is not a consistent notion. What it means is that um, the universe keeps evolving as uh, quantum fields until it is forced to stop evolving as quantum fields uh, through observation, through, in the act time framework, it's causation across Markov Planckett. And this is even more fundamental than quantum physics because the very basis of the universe, cosmological laws, they evolve, they change. And because of Noether's theorem, uh, the cosmological law traduces the physical symmetries. And those physical symmetries uh, can be demonstrated through Gauss theory to be formally equivalent to the self organization of cosmic graphs, which is, by definition, active inference. So let us uh, disentangle the claims that are made here. Uh, first, I say that active inference is pretty close to be a universal acid uh, solution or a basic set of tools that there is all problems. Uh, because it provides an intuitive framework, which is a formal and cognitive ontology for the study of cognition and synthesization of those things. Uh, the energy principle, it provides uh, basically a grounding principle. Uh, so a basic physical explanation for how we get embodied intelligence, how we get cognitive systems and continuous systems in the world. And if we want uh, the energy principle to actually do that efficiently, Truly, I don't know. We need to develop a mathematical theory, not only of uh, self conservation within uh, set spaces, but of self -conservation, sorry, self conservation of unfolding spaces uh, on the grounding of active inference. If we do that, we can address the criticism from uh, creativity. We need to do that to address the criticism from creativity, but it will all make, also make uh, basically a fringe principle, a basic explanation for all of physical reality. So uh, there is one concern that could be raised uh, about this, which is that the view that the universe is unfolding, that there are proto-minds that make up the things that we see, it's somehow opposed to the naturalistic worldview. And it is indeed opposed to uh, the classical view of realism, of the idea that you can have objective properties in the world that are um, uncoupled from interaction, from observation. Uh, this is the formulation of Einstein uh, that is displayed here. And the Fermi principle understood as a grounding principle for the physics of creation or basically admitting that the physics of creation is a problem, it grounds what is called anatta, which is uh, the Pali word for uh, basically there is nothing in itself. It grounds the view that there are no individuated things and no individuated properties outside interaction, uh, well, in the Fermi principle formalism across Markov Blankets. And uh, the view that the objects that we talk about are true, uh, notwithstanding our subjective way of describing it, it is called scientific realism, and we don't need it uh, to ground a naturalistic scientific worldview. We can be naturalistic worldview derives from the basic idea that you can uh, study the world as uh, something that derives from causal relation in nature. And this is totally compatible with some kind of participative realism where the observer participates in shaping reality. You do not need a solipsistic uh, thing in its self-existence uh, to ground it. So uh, there is no problem here. So I will thank uh, Kairos Research and the Active Inference Lab uh, for uh, the infrastructure, let's say, of this work. Kairos Research, which is a participative laboratory for the study of cognitive and self conserving systems, that is meant to electivize research, which is to bring it closer to pragmatic, uh, embodied setting of social political dynamics. And the Active Inference Lab, uh, straightforwardly, is a lab about active inference. And I'd like to thank people who gave feedback for the observation. And I'd like uh, for you to check the project uh, in OSF. So thank you. I will be taking questions now. Well, um, really, really, really cool stuff. Um, who would like to come and... Okay, I see that Sergio is already on his way. There we go. Hi, very nice talk. Uh, I would like to be a little bit uh, to ask whether um, 
in terms of Karl Popper, uh, could we falsify the free energy principle? No, no, it's math. No. You can falsify any model that is formulated on the basis of the free energy principle because it's a model. You cannot falsify the math. This is not how this works. Right. Okay. Kevin? Hello. Uh, thank you for all this really uh, neat talk. And this is a, uh, actually, this actually goes into the mathematical aspect of things. So I'm curious as to, to which uh, mathematical formalisms are being kind of used to underpin, I guess, uh, the free energy principle and maybe like active inference as the extension. And, you know, and maybe for context, right, because I'm coming from the idea of like, okay, well, you have Euclidean geometry and parabolic and other non Euclidean geometries. So that's the thing, right? But also, like, more fundamentally, you have different axiomatic structures. You have like the Merle Finkel uh, set three with the axiom choice. And with, without the axiom choice, and within the mathematical community, you have like disagreements about which rules do you want to uh, kind of play with, so to speak. Uh, and then, in more kind of, you know, in the computer science realm, there is a, a different set of axioms that actually don't use the law of the excluded middle. Like, right, so there's this thing called like the proof by contradiction, where basically you uh, you assume the opposite of what you're trying to prove, show that leads to some type of logical contradiction, and then boom, right? Well, that can't be the case, so the other proposition might be true. But intuitionistic mathematics actually says, no, 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 that's actually not uh, a rule we want to play with, because what if you have a situation where, like, you know, the algorithm just hasn't finished yet? It's not true or false. It's just like there's this third category of unknown, and so you, you actually have different kind of logical foundations for uh, for for variations, a different axiomatic uh, or different axiomatate, uh, different ways to axiomatize mathematics. So I'm kind of curious as to what the uh, the underlying framework is. I know that's a lot, so forgive me if that wasn't uh, clear. Okay, so the idea that uh, you cannot, you have in, the, in fact several possible mathematical grounding to things, which I agree to. Uh, I do not know if you want me to arbitrate between things. I cannot do this right now, uh, but I want to signal that I am not in a PNG program. I want to get into it on the math of collective intelligence and this is on spot. Uh, right now, I don't know. Uh, there can be links to category theory, for example. There is clear links to God's theory. I cannot, I do not, I do not see how this relates to the foundation of mathematics. So this is uh, something to develop. Oh, okay, gotcha. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hiya. Good morning. Um, thanks for the great talk. It's, it definitely Thank is you. a good wake up uh, jolt in this hour. Um, so, well, first of all, I, I really resonate with, with the point you emphasize. I, I also agree that creativity is something that's, um, I wouldn't say it's incompatible with the new principle, but something that's extremely underlooked and underemphasized. And it's actually Maxwell who really reminded me uh, of this it's in a conversation that Carl just is a more inclined to emphasize the conservative nature of the FEP. Um, and so I think it's really good that, that people like you in this talk are kind of doing the complementary direction, right? What is the creative power that also follows from the FEP, in my opinion? So I was kind of surprised that you, because I was confused, first for clarification, when you say creativity, were you just more referring to the creative aspect of autopoiesis or the, uh, the, the creation of the, the, the generation of different trajectories? Or are you also including the more uh, psychological phenomenon of creativity, because because uh, you didn't go deep oh. into that. Both, uh, yeah. As I said, uh, creativity, as I put it here, uh, as I formalize it, is any kind of symmetry breaking that is not entailed by the system macroscopic and starting conditions. So it's basically unfolding set spaces, uh, unfolding asymmetries. The fact that they are uh, biological or cognitive, they are still quotes, is not relevant because those are the same. Those are organizational features. Oh, okay. So you're like trying looking for just the most general notion of creativity, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, th I think one thing that was um, I found interesting. So at some point, at the slide of uh, intrinsic to extrinsic, and extrinsic to intrinsic, and with a bit of a, well, I'm gonna just flatter Maxwell here, a bit of a Maxwellian point about you know beyond internal and external. I think it's important to acknowledge that if we just take the internal relative to the agents that in there that you have a lot of the intrinsic extrinsic dynamics and, and therefore also the 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 phenomenon of of dealing with hidden states 
um, and so, so in in a way, when when you have within the agent the processes of mutual active inference or mutualistic inference um, across different skills, you, you still have to contend with that that those uh, subsystems don't know about much of the rest of the yeah. system. And more importantly, the whole ecosystem has like kind of regions that are unmodeled, I would say. Um, and yeah. I think it's, it's, it's in these, oh, sorry? That uh, I did not make a distinction between internal and external. I made a distinction between intrinsic and no. extrinsic. Uh, the okay, intrinsic uh, part is basically yeah. what the agent can understand. So I can understand that if I chair gets into my head, I'm hurt. I cannot understand how a uh, lesion uh, on a specific neuron will affect how I move. So there are facts that uh, surviennent, that um, invite themselves into the subjective perspective of the agent, uh, regardless of whether they have uh, a priori epistemic values, whether they are priors. So what's intrinsic is all what that the agent can understand, mm -hmm. and what's extrinsic is everything else. So that's sure that you have an interesting and important play between intrinsic and intrinsic architecture between scales, because what's intrinsic at my scale, for example, there is a bike there, there is a computer there, I get it. Uh, it's not something that the cell uh, in my ear that uh, enables uh, auditory processing understands. There are some other things that I do not, that I do because I did physics of addition, but that I'm not supposed to. Um, so, um, does this, I think this, um, I, I don't think this answers you, but I, I think it disintegrates an important point. Um, I'm a bit lost because I think this is a bit complicated for me to follow, but 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 I think what I'm getting at is, is that uh, it's in these interplays that maybe creativity is most interesting to think about. Um, so, so yeah, so thanks for clarifying. You're talking about interesting extrinsic. I think what I'm trying to explore is is the the way that within the agents, there are basically extrinsic geometries that are acted upon by the agents without being actually internalized. As in, it's not accessible to, to the same degree of uh, systematic instrumentalization. Rather, there's like an... Uh, extrinsic geometries that are uh, attuned to the agents, but not um, as equipped. How do, how do I say this? It, it doesn't have the same kind of agency. I'd say if there is like a generative power to a lot of um, Markov blankets that are not really the Markov blankets involved in what we would refer to as our kind of conscious executive attention. So basically, you know, when, when you folks psychologically talk about creativity and the artists of, oh, there's something welling up in me, and basically I'm asking or wondering about um, how what the source of that is and kind of implying that I think that FEP might still be very um, compatible with explaining that, for example, not just exploring state spaces, but con configurations, like how do you, um, connect different Markov languages or subsystems together to yeah. create certain dynamics. And I think the connection is the critical issue. Exactly, right? So the infrastructures between these uh, uh, that, that connect or interweave the different subsystems. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm just rambling a bit, but but um, mm. but I definitely get more where you're, where you're getting at. So thank you. Yeah, I think we agree on the core issue of the FEP. Uh, so if there is no line of the question, I'd like to uh, like more time to answer this of uh, Sergio Rubin. Uh, do you want to, Maxwell, do you want to do it now or can you wait two minutes? Oh, I mean, it was related to Sergio's point. I just wanted to explain um, the okay. whole falsifiability thing. So, I mean, on the one yeah. hand, I think uh, the idea of falsification in science is uh -huh. a philosophical gloss on the actual uh -huh. practice of science that doesn't actually add anything. Uh, yeah. Scientists aren't trying to falsify their hypotheses. It's always model comparison or hypothesis testing. Uh, even in the, the minimal case, you're comparing your hypothesis against the null hypothesis. We never, I mean, it, except in very gerrymandered circumstances, we don't falsify and critical experiments are really just a fabrication of philosophers, in my view. Um, so that leads me to say also, when people say the free energy principle can't be falsified, it's because the free energy principle at core is a piece of math, and you don't falsify math. 
you uh, you know provide a counter example, you show that you know the assumptions lead to a contradiction, but you don't falsify math and you, you wouldn't falsify the FEP itself any more than you would try to falsify calculus. It's just a, a category mistake. Uh, what can be falsified, as with you know other applications of the principle of stationary action, is whether the framework applies to a given empirical system. That's subject to falsification. You can say, oh, I can use the FEP and active inference to model this or that, and you can be you can be wrong about that. But the FEP itself is just math. And now it, you know, especially in this new Bayesian mechanics or stationary processes paper, the math has been fully worked out. Uh, there's uh, you know the existence uh, there's an existence proof. There's a construction. I mean, everything is is there effectively. The FEP yeah. just follows from from non-equilibrium exactly yeah it it, it, so, it it just flows from the thermodynamics Okay, so uh, I think it's a pretty critical issue for at least the development of the FEP because somehow um, you have I, 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 agree, I agree with you that uh, falsification is a very flawed criterion if you take falsification seriously nothing this is really you won't throw away evolution theory because you saw uh, butterfly that behaves but this is not just a consistent thing that you do so what you have is um, a softer more inductive kind of reasoning that exists even by Popper's uh, account uh, Lakatosh I think might be last uh, call on this and you have basically ways um, when you criticize a theory you have you cannot, you will not, uh, are not restated to just um, leave it away. You basically look at the assumptions uh, that make it go wrong and it's nice and try to fix them. You should do things very easily. And that is how scientists make things and that is how epistemologists make things. And somehow uh, people uh, in the behavioral science have got the idea that falsification is empiricism, which is specifically what uh, falsification was formulated against. So they think that everything that cannot be made into a difficult test is false and wrong and stupid. I, this is a big problem. I don't know how we got there, uh, but we are there. And people get angry basically when there are bits of theory that sees. Um, okay, okay, my son. Um, so uh, when people ask whether the FEP is falsifiable, and you tell them no, they are angry about it. And yes, Marco, it is uh, fair. Um, oh, Alius. Okay, I'm sorry. I we closed the chat because I'm just answering people on this chat, and this is inconsistent. Um, so falsification is inconsistent. People believe it is the opposite empiricism. And so when you have bits of theory that show, they are basically angry, but you cannot say things without a language. That is very basic thing that all people that do, that all people know at some level. And that is uh, precisely what Popper uh, went, uh, wanted to emphasize by the uh, mainstream historical account. So I don't know how to circumvent this because uh, people are just not willing to engage with theory. And uh, you cannot build empirical uh, predictions that are falsifiable, not theories, the prediction are falsifiable, uh, without agreeing on why to represent the world and why to speak. So I do not know how to do it, how to uh, make this bridge between the empirical level and the empirical communities and the more uh, theory oriented uh, communities, but it's critical to do this if you don't want uh, basically. Uh, if we don't want to keep uh, behavioral science that has literally the same standards as uh, 30s race science, which is not good standards for obvious reasons. And the free energy. Can you use the free energy principle to verify things? Let's say if we go to Mars and we want to know if there is light there, we can use the free energy principle as a test of verification. Uh, 
I'm not sure uh, what requirements were. I'm sorry. Can you rephrase? If you were, uh, expect me right. To... So, so there, there is this confrontation be between falsification and and verification. So what what stands at the end? It's the verification rather than falsification. So you verify things. Let's say if 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 a living system is alive or not. You verify by checking whether it's autopoiesis is still going on or it, it stops. So, uh, so in the realm of um, mechanical modeling, so what corresponds in my uh, table to mechanical and functional explanation, uh, you do basically what a good Bayesian agent will do, which is that you uh, provide mechanism, you check consistency with structure, you check consistency with phenology, you check consistency with system. And uh, in that domain, you can validate and you can uh, falsify this uh, due to a prediction. But in pure formalism, uh, I don't know uh, in the way you develop not the models themselves, but the language with which you develop the model. I do not know if you are a strong a priori uh, ways to ensure you are not wrong. So the um, a position I uh, hold is that you do not have truth, uh, at least in the sense of correspondence. So I'm not worried about this because I don't think we can solve the issue. Uh, but you will not do things in the world without taking some kind of hypothesis of some kind of speculation of some kind of uh, quantum leap between hypothesis. And, um, Actually, this is uh, part of what proper falsifianism is about. So you will have theories, uh, you will have formalisms that will compete for cognitive space in the head of scientists, and uh, that's it. Uh, and I don't know if trying to formulate a grand encompassing uh, demarcation uh, criterion for what math is useful is uh, constructive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we have time for another very quick question. Does anybody? Oh. Stephen. One question, when you talk about intrinsic and extrinsic, I'm wondering, because often we talk about motivations or teleology, i.e. what's the intrinsic or extrinsic like purpose or aim of a situation. Um, and I don't know how that, often extrinsic is then thought to be brought in from an external source, but it's, it could be extrinsic in terms of what the action policy of that particular regime of attention is about that makes sense like what's mm -hmm. so how does that fit in so it's not necessarily so it brings in the question of what it means to know you know if you talk about extrinsic and intrinsic knowing you may fall into the trap of kind of representationalism but if it's maybe linked to the teleology of the moment then you've got the idea of what it is what's adjacent to what it is and plausible and then okay. something acting bigger than that we're well, out of time, so I'll answer quickly. Um, you, we have three kind of uh, distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic at play. You have uh, the motivational, where it's basically um, reward versus uh, informational gain, uh, what we've seen. You have uh, the freestone definition, which is basically the structural versus functional landscape of the agent. You have what I say, which is uh, pretty close, but not quite the same because um, it's basically what is entailed by an agent model and what is not. So uh, formally, I don't know how th those two fit. I know they do not fit with the motivation. Uh, so I think you will cut me after. So I want to say again that I'd like to uh, get into a PhD on the math of collective intelligence. Please send my way any relevant offer you see. I will be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.
All right. Um, so we're going to take um, a 10 minute break. Uh, we will get back at 10. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Zerbo, for your uh, wonderful talk and uh, really cool discussion. Uh, Thank you.